This is another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. My name is Rebecca Tapp, and in every episode of Decoding Purpose, we speak to humans of both influence and impact to explore how life's turning points help us to decode purpose and to ignite a more meaningful and purpose-driven life. Welcome to another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. One thing I have noticed in my world and in talking to others in my network is that more than six months into this global pandemic, it's fair to say that we are all starting to feel a little weary. For some of us, that might be translating as stress or worry. For others, it might be irritation, anger or even rage. I know there are some of us out there right now suffering the full weight of depression and anxiety because let's face it, regardless of the silver lining moments of which I might say there are many, this is still an incredibly difficult time. So I ask you, just as I ask myself, how is that manifesting in our lives? How is that manifesting in our relationships What is it that we need to feel seen or feel heard? And what is it that we need to give others so that they can feel our support? Because at the end of the day, we've all been pulled apart. Some of us are are many miles and many hours away from friends, families and lovers, and we're simply getting by day by day. And even for those of us with our families by our sides, we can still feel isolated and lost inside our thoughts, our feelings and our weariness of a year that has felt like Groundhog Day. So how are you feeling? How are you really feeling? Because despite the distance, whether that be real distance or in our experience, emotional intimacy is the one and the only thing that can keep us truly connected. And intimacy can only happen through one door the door of purposeful and mindful communication. And that brings me to today's guest. Jonathan Miller has spent hundreds of hours in deliberate communication practice with a focus on conflict resolution. The catalyst for his passion around mindful communication started off with an argument with his wife on a road trip that led him to the realisation that applying purpose in not only how we speak, but in also how we respond, enables us to build bridges to a deep level of emotional intimacy and conscious connection. What I love about Jonathan is that there is no bravado claiming that he is anything other than a normal, down-to-earth human who realised that the art of communication was a key in his ability to create deeply meaningful relationships. That said, there is nothing normal about his pursuit to own his story and to understand the stories of others in a more conscious way. As a result, he became a certified professional coach and has done extensive training in nonviolent communication. He is also a dedicated Vipassana meditation practitioner, mastering the art of purposeful presence. So without further delay... Let's talk with an incredible voice of communication mastery. Welcome to the podcast, Jonathan Miller. Jonathan Miller, welcome to the Decoding Purpose podcast. Such a pleasure to be speaking to you today. Likewise, it's a pleasure to be here. Jonathan, now on this show, um, I get to speak to an array of personalities with so many different perspectives on the true nature of what purpose is. And even though, you know, every single guest is unique, I think it's fair to say that, that 2020 has been a year that in a sense has physically pulled us apart, but in some ways it's brought us together as we collectively face a crisis. So I'm interested to know in in your world and through your lens, how has this turning point year influenced your connection to purpose on a planetary level, a professional one, or even personally? For me, if anything, my purpose has become more clear than ever. 
I think before this all kind of went down, the intention always was to, at least for me, make an impact and shape the world in the way that I want to see it be shaped. Mm. And seeing the results of all this turbulence has solidified that vision for me and had me feel more driven than ever that this change that I want to see is not just a nice to have, but it's a must have. Mm. It's a must have for my, the quality of my life, the quality of the life of people I love. And I think for the quality of life that our species as a whole is, is really searching for. So it has been a, a, a turbulent time. I mean, like for me, just like anyone, lots of uncertainty is always challenging to deal with. And I have personally found this time to be one of thriving. Mm, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't think of a more relevant time for your content with regards to mindful communication and conflict resolution, because, you know, in a conversation about decoding purpose, we, uh, as I've just said, we're living in, in such, you know, interesting times and crazy times, whether it be through social change, uh, geopolitical change, global pandemics, emerging technologies, you name it. And what we're seeing is uh, a lot of stories from the past and talk toxic stories that need to be seen, that need to be heard and need to be healed, you know, they're starting to emerge. And I think we're seeing that with obviously Black Lives Matter, but also the Me Too movement or even, um, you know, the recent climate climate strikes. So, it, you know, in your opinion, if we unpack mindful communication uh, on that global level, on that collective level, how do we as human beings find a place of, of union when there is so much anger and hurt? You know, that's a very big question that we're going to try to unpack right now. Mm. And if and, there and, was a simple answer. And to answer, be fair, this was my second last question. I've actually, okay. I've actually swapped it around. And the reason I'm diving around here is, is because of your first answer and, and because it really got me reflecting on, well, what does it actually mean? What does it mean to be mindful in our communication and to be mindful of how we go about conflict resolution right now, uh, collectively? You know, we've been tackling some of these problems like racism, like climate change. And for me, there's a little bit of pessimism there. Mm. I worry that we're going to be tackling these issues by putting on some band-aids until some more problems come up. We're going to be just solving problems and problems and then more problems and problems will come. And I think what we're really missing here is a shift in the context of what it means to be a human being. Mm. And I know that sounds very grandiose, but bear with me for a second, and I'll kind of let you into kind of how I'm seeing this, is that a context is kind of like the frame with which we see the world. And we naturally have a context. As subjective human beings, we have a context that frames our reality. And the frame is based on our assumptions and beliefs and generally what we think is possible based on the limits of what we know is possible. Mm. And, and that shapes everything. So a perfect example of this is the, I think it's the four-minute mile. The, that's, that, was the, that was the thing that happened in the 50s where literally no one had ever run uh, anything below a four-minute mile. And I apologize, if it's like a three-minute mile or five-minute mile, I, I, I'm, I'll, take the, I'll take the hit on that one. That's my bad. But this idea that there was this, this time frame that, no kidding, scientists believed was literally impossible for human beings to go that fast. And then all of a sudden, there's this guy in, I think, like 52 and he ran a four-minute mile. And within a year or two, there was a bunch of other people that did it. And so all of a sudden, this frame that you have shifted because what we thought was possible now became possible. And all of a sudden, our context completely changed. Mm. Now, what happens is we have all these challenges that we're facing as a species. And what we're doing is we're... we're solving and tackling these problems from the same lens that we always have. Now, some things have shifted, no doubt. 
but there's still a lens that is kind of stopping us from going beyond it. There's this frame that's actually acting like a border Mm -hmm. and we want to continue to push that border as far as possible so that we can really see what else is possible. And a lot of that is going to come in a conversation because conversation is the only only tool short of violence that we really have to make change. Mm. And there's going to be, we're going to need some massive shifts in terms of how we're thinking about the way that we communicate, the way we relate to one another, um, that's going to need to happen in order for us to really start to transcend with urgency, might I add. Uh, you know, climate change is just like a terrifying concept mm. that is happening very quickly. It's going to happen, you know, within the next couple of generations. Uh, we need to see some massive shifts in terms of how we're thinking and how we're communicating with one another. We need to you know, just things that off the top of my head that I can think of is understanding that you have a perspective. Like that, that, that sounds maybe a little juvenile, but the, the, the fact is that, you know, I, I go into conversations and so often I forget that I have my truth, not the truth. Mm, such an important and, distinction. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and that is what I would call a perspective. It's a perspective. And guess what? There are as many perspectives as there are people on the planet. And when I go into a conversation and I just forget that even for a moment, all of a sudden I start playing this game of who's right and who's right. I'm right. I'm always right. Why would I not be right? Why would I do something that's not right or not logical? And that is a deadly trap when there are more than one person who thinks that way because then you cannot reconcile in terms of differences. So we talked about a lot of things here. And I and just to kind of summarize some of my major points is that we have this context of what we think is possible and how we're going to solve these issues. And this context is framing everything. And what needs to start happening is start shifting this context so that we can think of new novel solutions that didn't exist before. And communication is going to be our tool to do that. However, there is some serious work that needs to be done in terms of us as humans on an individual and collective level to better realize uh, you know, that we are these subjective humans with points of view that aren't necessarily the truth, with a capital T. Mm. Jonathan, thanks for going deep early into the conversation with me here because what I think is so important about this is we have been able to set up a context around why now. Why is it so important right now to focus on mindful communication? And it, it's not so much about necessarily trying to solve all of the collective issue, but understanding that collective issues like racism, as an example, or sexism or climate change, changing those things actually start in the home. They start with the individual conversations. They start with conversations like the one that I know acted as a catalyst for your purpose in the back of a camper van where you and your now wife had, you know, had an argument. And I think so many people out there would relate to that moment where you've, you know, you've been with your partner and and you press each other's buttons. Um, And so I want to understand a little bit about your turning point in a moment, but I just firstly wanted to acknowledge it's great to really go there and understand the context of this conversation, but also to understand that the solution to that context starts right now in in understanding how our one-on-one communication fits into the grander picture. A collective is just a group of individuals, Mm. right? So that's really where it starts. It starts with those individual conversations. I love that you brought racism up because that's something that I've been um, deep into over the last several Mm. months, completely blind to so much of this privilege, so many of my unconscious biases and not realizing how much covert racism Mm. that I was contributing to this system um, that's being upheld and oppressing you know, the black, indigenous, and people of color communities. Um, And when it comes to that communication, I mean, 
yeah, there's 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 protests happening and that kind of stuff. But it really starts with conversations that I've been having with my friends and with my family. And they're uncomfortable mm. conversations. Mm. They're conversations. I'm not being rewarded for these conversations. I don't get a medal for it. No, no one's recognizing these. Um, and they're incredibly aligned to my values and incredibly important for me to see that change. And it starts with those individual conversations. Mm. Now, to answer... Uh, an initial question you had around why mindful communication and why now? I think for me, it's just I'm alive right now. So this is what I see as the most important thing. But one thing you mentioned right at the beginning of the episode is is this time of change that's happening and it's it's going faster and faster. And the one thing that comes up for me, I remember this was a light bulb moment for me a few a few years ago, is this idea of emerging technologies. And the fact is that with AI and all of these innovations happening, uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation around jobs that are going to be disappearing. Mm. And more and more of our daily tasks that we can do as people are going to be easily replicated by machines. And it's going to make our lives easier and more seamless and more convenient. And there's one thing that is going to consistently separate us from those machines. And it's our ability to communicate, to make judgments, to have conversations. Mm, the soft skills. That is not something that can be, yeah, soft skills, exactly. Mm. It, it's just not something that can be outsourced. And so uh, I, I don't see why we want to continue delaying um, this all valuable skill that cannot be, cannot be replicated and will only serve us and move our individual lives and our collective lives in a direction that we would want to head in. So, Jonathan, there's so much to unpack today about mindful communication and conflict resolution. However, before doing that, uh, earlier I mentioned that little stout between you and your partner in the back of a, a camper van. And uh, in, in doing my research for this podcast, I know that you uh, chose to go on a bit of a sabbatical and it was on that camper van trip that you kind of reached your turning mo- turning point moment that really acted as a catalyst for purpose uh, in your life and and what you're doing today. Can you tell me a little bit about that period of time in your life? Um, Not so much the specific argument, but why was that period of time such a magical period of time in terms of your evolution and in becoming uh, the thought leader and the coach and consultant that you are today? It's funny that you ask that question, not so much about the story itself, but about that time. Mm. And what really created the clarity that I was looking for at that time was I had the space to, to search for that. And it's funny because I'm reflecting on the time we have now. There are a lot of people who are out of jobs, a lot of people at home. Maybe they're not commuting. They have all this extra time on their hands. And I've been seeing a similar rhetoric kind of going around where people are starting to ask a little bit more questions about, huh, what, it, what is my life about? What, what does it mean to live a good life? And I had the opportunity, like you said, to move into this camper van, and it was actually quite intentional. I, I quit my job, and, and part of it, a, a part of it that I had planned was to do that thinking. I remember one of the first books I read was this book called Passion of the Western Mind, and uh, by Richard Tarnas, by the way, amazing book. And uh, I thought, you know what, I'm going to find answers in this philosophy textbook. That's what I'm going to find. I didn't find any answers there, but it was a very interesting read, and I knew a lot about philosophy at the time. Um, That was very much the intention. I created the space to actually do thinking and reflecting. I fortunately had a partner who was very reflective as well, so we had lots of conversations about this kind of stuff, Um, and that has been a mainstay in my life from that time, and and it's continued now, although I don't have as much space. You know, I still have, I have a coach that I meet with every week. It gives me lots of space to do self-reflection, to uh, raise my awareness about things that are happening in my life. So it was that space and time that I created very deliberately that created um, an opportunity to really dig into what my life was going to be about. Mm. 
Do you remember having any light bulb moments? I mean, I know you spent a fair bit of time in in India and and really went on a bit of a spiritual journey and did lots of meditation and all of that sort of thing. The light, the biggest light bulb moments for me were in that van when I noticed how quickly our issues were resolved by mm. simply changing some of our communication. And then in regards to the India and the meditation, because you mentioned it, yeah, there was definitely not maybe a, a single moment, but there was a moment. I actually sat one of these 10-day Vipassana meditation retreats. Which you is incredible, by have. the way. I mean, I, I love meditation. I don't know if I could. It's a silent meditation, right? It's 10 days of silence, yeah, nine and a half days of silence. Yeah. yeah. And um, it can be pretty intense. It's 10 hours a day of meditating, uh, no talking, no eye contact. You only get a snack for dinner at your first retreat. Um, it's really hard. And, and, and all you're doing is sitting there. It's not like complicated, mm. but it's really hard. And I did the first retreat. And I thought, okay, this is like kind of cool. And I, like kind of pursued. I was interested in meditation. I wouldn't say I was dedicated to it. But it was after that second retreat that I did. And there was something that shifted for me where I really understood the power of the practice in my life and what it was going to contribute to me. And I knew that I was going to continue taking this practice seriously for the rest of my life. And I have not missed a day since. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it also speaks so strongly to the idea of creating space to simply be, which you did in a really intentional way just by taking a, a sabbatical to start with. But then meditation is a way to really just do that in the present moment to kind of stop all the chatter and just to allow space. And, and it's a pattern I have seen in the discovery of purpose that often the inklings of purpose start to emerge in that space of open presence. And, and I think that's something you really tap into when you meditate. For others, the practice might be yoga. It might be something creative like singing or art. I'm not saying everybody has the same way of doing it, but there there is something in creating that space for stillness and getting out of the head that really helps purpose to surface. I completely agree. Mm. And, and funny enough, uh, I especially relate to my own experience in meditation because, yeah, you're sitting for 10 days, for 10 hours a day. You got lots of time to think. You know, people tell me, I, I share, oh, yeah, you know, I, I do these retreats. I've done, I've done now six or seven of them. And they're like, wow, like, I don't know. I couldn't do that. I could not talk for 10 days. And my response is always the same. Like, well, you don't, you, I mean, your lips stop moving. You don't stop talking, though. It's just going on in your head the whole time. Mm. Um and, and that's the thing, this, this retreat, and funny enough, it does create the space to, to do that thinking, even though that's not the intention. Like you have very clear instructions. It's watch your breath, scan your body, watch the sensations in your body. Those are your instructions. And yet, naturally so, with that space, your mind will drift as it always does. And your mind will drift to things that are important to you. And yeah, there's some awesome insights that can come from that. So, Jonathan, I want to I want to dive into the world of of conflict, but uh, before doing so, I think it's important uh, that we maybe take a moment to kind of decode and define what conflict is. So, can you can you unpack this unpack this idea of conflict for me? What is it? How do we define it? So, I love using dictionary definitions. So, the dictionary yeah. definition really around conflict is this idea of coming into collision or disagreement with, mm. is to, to just be in opposition with. That's it. It's a very simple kind of thing, just to be in opposition with. All we need to have is a disagreement. It doesn't have to necessarily escalate, and that is a sign of conflict. Now, we're familiar with more major conflicts, maybe between individuals you have people yelling at each other, pointing fingers, arguing. You have major conflict, like major wars. These intractable conflicts, intractable conflicts are ones that we don't really see a resolution, like the Israeli-Palestinian problem, um, the, the, the province of Kashmir, what's going on there, um, you know, issues around abortion and homosexual rights and that, that kind of thing. Those are seen as more intractable issues. But So those are what I find we typically associate conflict with. However, there is also very minor conflicts that don't escalate at all. I'll give you an example. Uh, I might ask you, hey, Rebecca, like, what do you want to get for dinner tonight? 
um, I'd go salad. <laughs> S- salad. salad. Let's I don't go know. salad. I, you want salad? I don't know. I, I feel like Thai food. Yeah. So there, there's a conflict. Yeah. Technically, right there. Now that's not going to escalate. We're going to resolve this pretty quick. We're going to be like, okay, well, you know, you, I want Thai food. You want salad? Like, oh, how about burgers instead? Oh, burgers, great. Okay, good. And yeah, then it's, yeah. it's resolved, right? So there was technically a conflict there. But it didn't become a big thing. And most of our conflicts are like that too. Yeah. And you can see how just ubiquitous conflicts are. They're actually a very normal, natural, and then inevitable part of life. They're everywhere and they happen all the time. As long as you're in relation with someone else, mm. conflict will be there. Mm. That's, a, that's a great segue uh, to my next question because in doing my research for today's podcast, I actually heard you speak about conflict as being quite a normal part of the human experience, which is kind of what you're saying now. Yet I think for many of us, we'd rather not think of it as normal or even as useful. Um, that said, I think it'd be fair to say that conflict itself is is probably a core ingredient in human social evolution, given humans by their very nature want to belong and and be part of the tribe. So therefore, conflict is something that in, in some ways enables evolution, you know? So can you talk me through the science and the purpose of conflict from an evolutionary perspective? This is not a huge area of expertise, but mm. I know, I mean, we, one, one could recognize that a lot of these movements, like the civil rights movement, independent nations, all of those kind of amazing things that have progressed us forward towards, you know, more peace and more independence and more autonomy. Those moments of social transformation, they were birthed from some sort of conflict. There was naturally a disagreement of some sort. Mm. And it was overcome. And from that came this incredible new thing. So from kind of that more macro perspective, conflict is almost... uh, a requirement for that to happen. Mm, mm. Well, I mean, even to to the point that I know that the human brain, the reason we have brains the size that we have them is is because of our ability to connect in tribe, our ability to communicate. Um, and it's that engagement that enabled us and our brains to to grow to the size they are in comparison to other other animals, of course. Um, and, and that's kind of where that question came from as well, is that I wonder what role conflict has played in that biological evolution and if there's a link there. I'm sure there is, um, but I think, you know, it's, it's very interesting to look at that side of, of how normal conflict is in our growth as a species. Yeah, not to mention, I mean, like you said, we're social creatures. Yeah. And if co- conflict was always there and conflict is now, it's definitely had some sort of opportunity to shape the way we, we think, right? Yep, absolutely. And look, in, in unpe- unpeeling the layers of what ignites conflict, there are many aspects to explore, um, from belief systems to culture to, you know, who we choose to be in the world. And all of those things will inform our communication and, and I guess the conflict that we engage in in our lives. But underneath all of that, there's, I imagine, a common thread of, of emotional exposure, which is what makes conflict so scary, um, in that, you know, it, it really represents this idea of of conflict might make us vulnerable or we might uh, feel shame or we might be exposed in some way. So can you talk to me more about the emotional exposure that occurs when we are faced with a conflict? You know, dealing with uh, difficult conversations can be really frightening. Mm. And that's because there's a lot of uncertainty there. There's a lot of uncertainty. And as humans, we don't like uncertainty. We don't like the unknown because it's unpredictable and it can potentially put us in danger. At least that's how our brains are operating. That's maybe not how we're consciously thinking, but that's what's going down under. Mm. Now, when it comes to these emotional responses, those are just natural responses from thoughts that arise in our head that have us act in certain ways usually just to keep, usually to keep us safe. Mm. Now the whole world of emotions, I mean, we can, you and I, we can do a whole other 
you know, three hour episode on just looking at emotions and all the science emerging in the field of affective neuroscience and all that kind of stuff. But I want to break it down really, really basic in terms of how emotions play a role and why they're so challenging to deal with in our conflicts. Because they really are at the heart of our conflicts. Mm, it really absolutely. is our emotions. Yeah. So I want you to think of this. I, I typically use the word emotion and feelings quite interchangeably, although there are nuances. Um, and I'll explain kind of both perspectives so that they make sense. If you think about what a feeling is, we have feelings like, oh, I feel angry, I feel happy, I feel sad, whatever that is. A feeling, let me ask you, actually, um, if I say, can you describe feeling angry? Describe the an an feeling of anger for me. Mm. Well, you know, it's it's in it's in the body. It's it's a heat. It's a, a there's an intensity to anger. It's um you know there's there's a, there's a sense of being slightly out of control when we're when we're angry. We're not in that rational part of our um our way of being. There's something that's a little bit unsafe just about being angry. Absolutely. Yeah. And you hit it right on the head, right at the beginning. It's, it's in our body. Yeah. It's this body experience. And in fact, you can think about the word feeling. That's what it's describing. It's, oh, I feel angry. There is this set of sensations that emerge when I feel angry. When I feel agitated, I have a tightness in my chest and actually my jaw as well. My wife can notice it right away when I'm feeling frustrated because my jaw tenses up. Um, and everyone experiences stress and anxiety all differently. Some people get stiff in their shoulders and their neck. They feel butterflies in their stomach. They feel their face heating up, whatever it is. There's some sort of bodily reaction that's happening. And when I use this word anger or I use this word happy, what we associate with that word is our own internal experience of that feeling. Mm. So that is, in essence, what a feeling is, what an emotion is. Now, if we tease it out a little bit, a feeling is the actual affect. It's the actual um, sensations in our body. They're called interoceptive sensations, and they're active all the time. We usually don't feel them. We only feel them when they're uh, very gross sensations, maybe like a sharp pain in the stomach because you're hungry or if you need to go to the bathroom or when you're angry. Even those are more subtle sensations, but they're always there. And emotions, I like to think of them as kind of energy in motion. Like you have these feelings going on in your body and it gets you, it actually gets you moving mm. because these emotions are this incredible human technology that has existed for millions of years that actually point to something that's really important to us in that moment. And it gets us moving to resolve that thing. Mm. So for example, I might be... Um, I might be, have you ever been in New York City, Rebecca? I have, yeah, I have. Okay. In, in New York City, they, I've seen it a few times. I'm like in these old apartments and I don't know why they have these, but they have these pipes and they're just blazing hot and they're just like in the middle of like, like against the wall in a hallway. It's so dangerous. I don't even understand how that's like legal. Anyway, there are these like piping height, hot pipes, right? And say that you and I are chit-chatting in the hallway, and all of a sudden I lean my hand onto this pipe. Yeah, it's going to hurt. A very, <laughs> it's it's going to hurt, right? Yeah. A very tricky question for you here. Do I want to feel that pain or not? No, of course you don't. Of course you don't. In fact, your natural I reflex, I imagine, would pull your hand off hot object or pipe. That's right. <laughs> and in fact, in order to have that reflex... I'm going to need to feel some pain, aren't I? Mm. Yeah. There's a purpose. Yeah. It, it has a purpose, doesn't it? Yeah. It's pointing to something that's going on right now in this moment that's really important. And in fact, if I didn't feel that pain, my hand would just start to melt into that pipe. It would char. Like, there are some terrible things that would happen. So that pain, that feeling is pointing to something really important. And when we're in our conflicts, that same thing is happening it, at, at, in a real time and super complex. There's all these different emotions that are reacting to all these different thoughts and all these different stimulus happening. And so, and it's pointing to things that are important to us at this moment. Now, typically when we're in those more stereotypical involved conflicts, 
yeah, you get those emotions like anger and agitation and frustration and fear and embarrassment and confusion, those kinds of things. And they're pointing to things that are important to you right now, some needs of yours maybe that are not being met. Mm. And that's why they take over our conflicts. We don't think rationally because right now in that moment, although we're having this conversation, there's a bunch of things going on inside me that are literally distracting me from being able to have an open, clear conversation with you. And naturally so, I continue to have the conversation and I'm not speaking clearly. You know, I'm not thinking the way that I want to be thinking. I'm saying things that I might be regretting. And so naturally the conflict tends to worsen. We tend to fight, argue. We use all these very what I would call ineffective communication strategies um, because none of our needs are being met. We're not feeling heard and understood. We're not feeling that respect that we want. We're not feeling peace and ease that we want as human beings. So there's kind of all of those things happening in conflict. So you can see why emotions play this huge role and they, it's very easy for uh, it to take us out. What are your thoughts in kind of unpacking some of this? Because I just shared a lot of different things. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Well, look, I, I have three areas that I'd love to unpack with you. I think um, the first part is your connection to the presence of emotions and this idea of emotion as literally energy in motion. I think that's an interesting idea to look at in the context of purpose, actually. Um, and it, it kind of leans into what I was talking about earlier with regards to meditation and creating a space for the emergence of purpose, I also really think um, that tapping into our bodies and our emotional intelligence can really give us uh, a good indication of whether we are on purpose or not. And the reason I say that is is because I think uh, when we do find that sense of meaning and fulfillment in our lives, we do literally um, tap into that, that lightness, that feeling of joy, opposed to when we're feeling disconnected and out of purpose, that our emotions and our bodies can also give us an indicator as to when, when we're off purpose. And that might come down, I'm not talking about big, grand, lofty purpose. I'm talking about something as simple as making a decision and trusting our feelings and trusting our gut. I'm talking about present in the uh, purpose in the present moment and our ability to tap into those emotions in the body, that energy emotion, I think is such a powerful indicator and compass to as to whether we are on purpose or not. So um, that was the first thing that sort of sprung to mind as you spoke uh, with regards to an exploration that decodes purpose in this conversation as a starting point. You know, I'm going to invite you and our listeners to imagine this scenario right now. If, yeah. you're, if you're driving, please don't close your eyes. But if you're not, you can take a moment here and close your eyes. And I want you to imagine this scenario. I want you to imagine the scenario where you wake up in the morning and all of your needs are met. You wake up and it's comfortable. You're feeling refreshed. All of your needs are being met. And as you go through the morning... They continue to be met. Whether you're alone or people are around, all of your needs are being met. And then the afternoon comes around and you're doing what it is that you had planned for the afternoon. And once again, all of your needs are being met in that moment. And as the evening comes around, you have just a wonderful evening where again, all of your needs are being met. Now, Rebecca, what are, what are some words that come to mind for you when you think about that scenario that I just walked you through? Fulfillment, gratitude, joy. That, that the feelings attached to the knowingness of all my needs being met are good feelings. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now, let me invite you to try a different scenario here. I want you to imagine you wake up in the morning and none of your needs are met. It might be an unfamiliar place, an uncomfortable bed, you had a poor sleep. And none of your needs are being met. And once again, as you go through the morning and peek into the afternoon, none of your needs are being met. Nothing is going the way that you want. And all day, it just seems to repeat itself. None of your needs are being met. 
And then as the evening comes around again, none of your needs are being met. Like none of them are really, really being met. Now, when you think of that scenario, what kind of words come to mind? Well, there's, I mean, there's a primal fear in that because basically what you're telling me is that my survival needs aren't met to start with. Yeah. So, you know, that there's basic survival there. So there, there is fear, there is anger, there is outrage. Yeah. And you can see this very clear connection here. Mm. When our needs are met, we feel what, we, what I would call very pleasant emotions, joy, happy, satisfaction, fulfillment. And when our needs are not being met, we feel fear, anger, rage, whatever it is. And so you can see that's just like what you said, this GPS, this barometer for our meeting our purpose in the moment, in the moment. Mm. You can use those emotions as that barometer, as that GPS, as a, as a flag, like, hey, something is not right, or hey, things are going really well right now. Mm. And, and I think also, and I won't go into this too much right now because there were two other points uh, that I wanted to bring into the conversation based on your last answer, but that that GPS, that inner knowing, that inner North Star is also our guiding light in regards to mindful communication as well because if we can really anchor in that, it's something that can, I think, guide us into our presence in order to be more aware of how we communicate. And, and that might be something we bookmark and continue to chat about in a minute because be, before going into that, I want to dive back into what you were saying about emotions. And there were two things, other things that I heard in there. And one of the things that you said was around uh, conflict being one of the most unpredictable things. You know, it's uncertain. We don't know when someone's going to completely sideswipe us with a comment or a remark we never expected or when an argument with our with our spouse is going to like come out of nowhere. And and I think what that creates is is that rapid emotional exposure that I was talking about before. And when I'm talking about rapid emotional exposure, what I'm talking about there is the the shame, the vulnerability. It's like the band-aids quickly ripped off, leaving us are uh, exposed. So I guess my question within this is, is if we know that conflict is uncertain, if we have some knowledge that it's going to create this environment of emotional exposure, which to use your, your example, the emotional exposure is touching that hot pipe and, and feeling that pain, how do we then go about being emotionally prepared, having a, a practice of emotional preparedness in order to be able to ground ourselves and to acknowledge that conflict is a normal part of our life, but at the same time it is also uncertain so that when it does, the wave of conflict does arrive, we are able to ground and anchor in our presence rather than just respond from that kind of out of control space of the, you know, I think um, the amyg amygdala hijack, basically the brain going, you know what, I'm going to just take logic out of the equation. How do we do that? The first step is to have a practice. Yeah. And we talked about some on this podcast. We talked about meditation or you know, some sort of creative thing or yoga, whatever, whatever it is, mm. is, is to have some sort of practice. That, that is a helpful start. The next thing to do is to have practices around communication and body awareness as well, because a lot of these things manifest in our body before we even, it even comes out of our mouth. So that's kind of like an early detection system. Another thing that's important, I would say, especially, you know, I think of the, a very common context for me is, is thinking about my partner, um, because that's where <laughs> it's just such a great source of learning for me um, and where my conflicts arise. And this can go for anyone is, is having kind of like an if then plan, kind of partnering with the other person and noticing patterns, just like well, we didn't get into, but kind of my initial moment where I noticed a pattern happening and so did, so did my partner. And that's when it, that's kind of where we dissected things and we had a plan. Taking breaks is okay too. Hmm. 
if you notice that you got hooked, you're in it. Yeah. You're playing that game of who's right where nobody wins. You know that game? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know that game very well. I think most people and, know that game. <laughs> yeah, I think we all know that game, yeah. don't we? Yeah, it's a game where everybody loses. And having that awareness in that moment, that's, that's an amazing thing. You know, I, I would say before I started this journey, maybe like one in a thousand, one in 10,000 times I would actually catch myself. And now it's much more frequent. Maybe like one in 10 times I managed to catch myself. You know, I still slip into the usual automatic behaviors. I swear, it just literally happened the other day. I just, I'm not being present in a conversation. My wife shares something that's, you know, really important to her, really vulnerable for her. And I'm just not really being there with her and it caused an issue, mm. you know? So th- this happens to me as well. This is totally. This is and, and I think I've heard you say this in, in reference to how you and your wife resolve those arguments in the early days. It, it, it was also about acknowledging your childhood and, and a lot of the unconscious behavior that has led you to this point where, where you're having difficulty navigating a conversation that so that it's led to conflict. That, that stuff that is, is really ingrained in years and years and years of, of behavior or conditioning that's come from, you know, family, culture, belief systems. So it's not like you can kind of just click it click it away and go, right, I've, I've got this conflict resolution thing now. <laughs> like it taps into right. to a depth of, of uh, thinking, behavior and feeling that's come before that. It's been a real gift to have a partner who is just as interested in working on herself and mm. exploring her unconscious biases as I am. It definitely made things easier. I'll, 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 I'll give you that. Um, but going back to kind of what I was saying, yeah, being willing to partner, really partner with the other person. So partnering with your partner, but even if it's a work colleague, pulling them inside and saying like, hey, how do we make this work between us? Being able to have a conversation like that really makes a difference. Taking a break whenever you're kind of feeling hot and as soon as you, as soon as you notice you're actually feeling hot, take that break, absolutely. Tell the person, listen, I can't think straight right now. I'm going to say things I'm going to regret. I just need, give me a couple hours. We're going to come back to this. I promise we'll come back to this because I know you want to resolve this. Saying something like that makes a huge difference. Mm. Uh, taking, even taking breaths in the conversation, again, just activating that parasympathetic nervous system on that exhale, so important. Um, those practices, those habits, um, although they take time to instill and they take time, and I'm still working on it uh, for myself. Uh, it makes a huge difference in your interactions. Like I said, instead of that one in 10,000 times, you can like yank yourself out of that, that days of being hooked. Uh, it happens then one out of 1,000 times, and then one out of 100 times, and then one out of 10 times. Mm. Um, that's that's the, the fruits of your labor when it comes to instilling those practices. Mm. Yeah, and I, and I think the, the underlying theme here is that conflict resolution isn't just for when you're in a conflict. It, it is a practice and it, and it is something that we need to be mindful of in how we show up every day so that we do have that, you know, that emotional preparedness for when those situations sideswipe us. Absolutely. Mm. I, I think that was so on point what you just said there, right there. Yeah, because we're talking about conflict from like a relational standpoint, like with another person, but those internal conflicts happen just as frequently. And overall, I mean, we, we're calling it this word conflict. I don't open up a, too much of a can of worms, but you know, we, we're talking about conflict specifically, but at the end of the day, what this is, is truly a life practice. Mm. It's a life practice in being able and willing to dance in the moment with whatever life brings your way. Mm. So when and I talk about um, conflict, you know, that's yeah, and please. it can be beautiful too. Is what I, what I was going to say is like, you know, we have this paradigm of conflict being kind of scary and and not something we want to uh, engage in. But if we can do that tango, the opportunity for growth in it can be deeply transformative. Absolutely, mm. absolutely, yeah. Mm. Jonathan, for many um, of my listeners, they're here because they're seeking to discover their purpose or to take their purpose to the next level. So with that in mind, I want to talk about influence with a focus on 
getting what you want. Um, purpose is often a journey, I think, where we are pioneering new ideas, we're creating new solutions or influencing others to buy into a new way of thinking. Um, you know, and when I think about the art of influence, I think about negotiations, I think about brokering deals or, you know, setting up strategic partnerships. Yet so often these meetings or when we're going into these meetings, it can feel like a war zone or, you know, a battle to fight for the deal we want. So we often already walk into these situations um, on the back foot a little bit because, you know, we're on a mission to kind of force or persuade someone to buy into our purpose. With that in mind, how can we shift from a mindset of conflict in negotiation to a more collaborative approach where we're able to really go into these, you know, negotiations, you know, meetings or or get these partnerships and genuinely create a win-win scenario? You know, if you go into work every day, and you have it that your boss is a big jerk. Mm. Guess how your boss is going to show up every single day? As a big jerk. <laughs> As a big jerk. Yeah. That's exactly what's going to happen. And if you're going to go into these meetings anticipating and like really using that confirmation bias, looking to confirm evidence that this is going to go poorly, guess what's going to happen? It's, it's going to go pretty poorly, mm. right? And the, the word you use is so poignant and it's just a, I think is like such a huge topic of conversation is around this idea of mindset and not to go on too much of a tangent, but like, let's even take a step back. Everyone's talking about this word mindset. Well, what is a mindset? What is a mindset? Well, mindset is our thoughts. It's our collection of thoughts it makes up our mindset and So if you are going into a meeting and all your thoughts are, this is not going to work out well, Um, you know, they're, they're out to get me, this is going to be really hard, da, 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 that's your mindset. That's the attitude that you're bringing into this conversation. Now, I often have to my conversations is I have a very different mindset. I have thoughts that are kind of like, how can I partner with this person? Mm. You know, what's this person really need that's going to have them be a yes for me? What, um, how can I turn this into a win-win scenario? Those are the thoughts that I often have going into some of these difficult conversations, difficult conversations like negotiations, boundary setting, giving and receiving feedback, those, those kinds of difficult conversations that happen every day. So the collection of thoughts that I have are very different from someone who is in more of that um, adversarial mindset. And so... I'm going to leave you with, I mean, this is something that I work with all my clients for, 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 for many months. So this is, we cultivate these mindsets that these are just default ways of thinking, right? Mm. I will leave you and our listeners with this idea though, that the way we transform our mindset is this trick I like to think about is our mindset is composed of what we set our mind to. And in other words, it's what we pay attention to. Mm. What you pay attention to is ultimately going to make up your thoughts. There's this, there's this quote, and I'm going to botch it. I know I'm going to botch it. <laughs> and um, it's, uh, Give it a crack. it's a Wayne Dyer quote. Here, I got it. I got it. It's, <laughs> Wayne Dyer has this amazing quote. It's, loving people live in a loving world. Hostile people live in a hostile world. Same world. Yeah. So um, pay attention to what's going to work, and you're more likely going to get things working for you. Yeah, I love that. It um it reminds me a lot. I I wear a few hats, but one of the businesses I work with are, are called Future Crunch, and so we uh, share a lot of stories around intelligent optimism, fundamentally good news stories from the world of medicine, technology, and science. But to mm. to link this back into what you're talking about here, um, one of our I guess our mottos or our our quotes uh, is around. Uh, if you want to change the story of the human race in the 21st century, change the stories you're telling yourself. And, it, yeah. and it's that idea that if you, if you choose to engage in fear, anger and outrage, in essence, you're buying into fear, anger and outrage, where if you choose to perceive the world as a, a hopeful, abundant place, then that is what you are creating in the world. Yeah, spot mm. on. Absolutely agree with that. Mm. So 
knowing that we were having this conversation today, it got me pondering and thinking a little deeply about the duality of conflict and I guess, uh, you know, the archetypes, the victim versus the victor, the good versus the bad, the right versus the wrong, the you versus the me. And I kind of was like, all of this comes down to power play. Power being the ability to get one's needs met. So I wanted to explore um, a few areas here. In the duality of conflict, power will be, you know, I imagine anyway, fairly evenly distributed in a healthy argument or, or an argument happening in a healthy relationship in that the power might get handballed around a little bit, but there will be a point of balance. The problem is that often this power dynamic can become toxic uh, in that there might be a narrative that one person has more power, as an example, meaning uh, there's less power for the other person and meeting the needs of one party might actually compromise the boundaries of another. And it's not always obvious when this happens. I mean, it might be obvious when someone is, is physically violent or punches someone in the face, but at other times these things can be, you know, a lot more subtle and a lot more unconscious and, and not, so, not so clear. So how do we know when conflict is healthy and useful opposed to conflict being destructive? I think the real telltale sign of that mm. is based on the outcome and in my opinion, the level of drama or violence in extreme cases that there are versus how much you can come up with a creative solution. Now, yeah, when we start talking about power dynamics, wow, does that complicate things? I mean, there are people studying, you know, peace and conflict studies in like the academic sphere. They've been doing it for decades and there's lots of papers on it and there's no real clear cut way to handle it. I think about the Israeli-Palestinian issue. I mean, that's an ongoing conflict for you know, almost a century. And there's obviously one power, there's one you know, group that has much more power than the other. Huge dynamic, huge, huge dynamic. I mean, how do you really go about uh, negotiating that kind of thing, right? It's, mm. That's why it's kind of one of those intractable conflicts. When it comes to our conflicts in our lives, though, the one thing that I'm going to leave with um, our listeners here today is just the idea of looking beyond our typical conflict responses of silence and violence, of avoiding and exploding. Because that's typically the two things that I know for my whole life, that's kind of what I was used to. Mm. And so you've I'm a got professional pass- avoider. The passive aggressive or the aggressive. <clears throat> oh yeah, I'm so good yeah. at that. I'm, I've been practicing that my whole life. Mm. So that those are the same as your fight or flight responses. And That's typically the direction we head in. However, that's not the only direction that we can go in. There are actually lots of other alternatives. We can be accommodating. We can be uh, compromising. We can be collaborating. We can ask lots of questions. Well, what is really important to their person? Not what their position is, but what are their interests underneath their position? What needs are they trying to meet underneath that position? There are lots of other tools and strategies that one can use when they're in these conflict situations to help even out the power dynamics a little bit. And again, we can do a whole other podcast on just kind of dissecting some of those things. But I am going to leave it with our audience at that point is that silence and violence are not your only options. Mm. Uh, It's really about finding out what's important to the other person and speaking to that thing specifically will make a huge difference. I don't know Mm. if that specifically answers your question. No, 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 it does. I mean, what I hear in that is, um, well, well, one part of what I hear is that if we can switch from ego into contribution, we can change the dialogue. And what I mean by that is ego is what I need into contribution, which is focusing on what you need from me and coming from that place. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. If the ego model works for you, you can definitely think about it like that. Um, there's lots of other great models of conflict resolution out there. I mean, there's so many amazing conflict resolution organizations, uh, negotiators, mediators with handbooks, all that kind of stuff. And there's amazing different perspectives on which to look at these conflicts and have them get resolved very effectively. Um, yeah, one of my favorites is nonviolent communication. If you haven't explored nonviolent communication, that is um, 
uh, that's the juice for me. I love that stuff. Mm. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And look, I guess the other part in that question um, that I was looking to unpack was around the the importance of knowing our boundaries in conflict. Yeah. And what role that plays and how important that is. You know, it, it's funny thing with boundaries is um, I spoke to a woman about this who's really, really great with, with boundaries. Yeah. And the one thing she points out is that most of us don't even know what our boundaries are. It's true. It's true. And, and it often comes down to this fact that we often don't know what they are until they're crossed. Mm. And then after they're crossed, we don't address them. That's where the issues really start. So it's okay to have boundaries crossed and then start to recognize them. Um, but we want to be hyper aware of um, that moment and address it quickly because the longer we delay with these boundary setting conversations, uh, the more likely that we are going to have a much, much more difficult conversation in the long run. Hmm. So Jonathan, I've, I've come to my last question today. As an expert in mindful communication and, and obviously conflict resolution, if you just happen to find yourself in a room of 20 of the most influential and purpose-driven people in the world, what is the one superpower that you would share with them to amplify their ability to change the world? Superpower, like... Like, one, like a one, real superpower? Like, or like... Uh, well, superpower in your world, in your world. Okay, it might okay, be a, yeah, com- a yeah. communication hack. Um, like yeah. out of everything that you know in your toolkit on mindful communication or conflict resolution, if you could only pick up one of those tools in and give it to these people to go and change the world, which one would it be? It would be something that we talked about right at the beginning of this episode. Mm is the ability to really understand, to really understand that we have perspectives and not the truth and really get that for yourself and really get this idea that it is subjective and it is not like the end all be all. And what what becomes available for us really, at least for me when I do that, is I can detach from my ideas My ideas are not who I am. They're just ideas. They don't necessarily need to mean anything about me. And um, if I could give that to the 20 most influential people, I think Mm. we'd be living in a dim world right now. Oh, look, I I mean, I think that's just gold. And it's something that I think, you know, being able to detach from the ideas and also to some extent feeling the emotion that's attached to the ideas and also being able to maybe separate yourself from that as well, not disconnecting from the emotion, but acknowledge it for what it is in, in order to be able to move into the action that you need to take in that moment. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Jonathan, um, I, I am sure that I'm going to have a lot of listeners out there who want to learn more about your world. And, and my understanding is that you have some pretty epic video programs and things available on your website. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, most certainly. Uh, first off, I have a podcast. So after you're done listening to all of the Decoding Purpose <laughs> podcast, all every episode, then you can flip over to mine, the Mindful Communication podcast, where I have interview interviews with experts from all over the world around the art and science of connection. Uh, and yeah, you can head over to my website, mindfulcommunication.me. You'll find a free four-part video training series on how to transform any and all conflicts in your life. It's a really amazing resource. And the Tough Talks Made Easy Conflict Assessment Tool where you get 45 oh, minutes with cool. me. Yeah, and if there's a conversation that you've been avoiding and you're having trouble and this conversation didn't have enough tips for you, um, you can we can sit down and come up with a game plan, a roadmap to find your most powerful, natural way to have that tough conversation you've been avoiding and find that piece you're looking for. And you can use the promo code DECODING50 for 50% off. Oh, wow. Thank you. I'll be checking that out. (laughs) And and I assume we can also find you um, on on all the local social media hangouts as well. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Jonathan Miller, you have just been so full of wisdom, insights and gold today. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the Decoding Purpose podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. 
Thanks for joining us on the podcast. If you have enjoyed the podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review. That would be greatly appreciated. And we'd also love you to join the Purpose Movement at Instagram by following us at Decoding Purpose Podcast. Also, a big shout out to our sponsors at Supernova Sound.